There are times when things of the world respond to our desires. We can push them this way, push them that way, and they allow themselves to be pushed. But there are also times when they don't respond at all. We push and they push back. And you realize that the extent to which they really are not under our control. We have some control over them, but there's an awful lot that we can't control. When the, when the world is out of control this way, you begin to wonder how you can live here. And you wonder if the idea of control has no validity at all, if it's entirely illusory. When you start thinking in that way, your heedfulness dies. And when heedfulness dies, all hope of developing any kind of skill, developing skillful qualities in the mind, will die as well. As the Buddha said, when you're heedless, it's as if you're already dead. The path to the deathless is heedfulness. So this is why we have to have conviction in the Buddha's awakening that he showed that it is possible through human action to find a true happiness. There are parts of your experience where you really can push and push all the way to a true happiness, a happiness that doesn't change, a happiness that causes no harm to anybody. It's good to hold that in mind. That's a strength of conviction. And it allows the principle of heedfulness to make sense. Because heedfulness comes down to the realization there are dangers in the world. But you can make a difference. If you couldn't make a difference, there'd be no reason to be heedful at all. You just have to go along with the flow. Allow the machine to chew you up and spit you out. And content yourself with not fighting against the machine. But even though the simple fact that we have this ability to content ourselves and not content ourselves shows that there's something we have some control over. And conviction in the Buddhist awakening gives us some very precise ideas of where that control is. After all, one of the principles he awakened to was the principle of karma the power of action. He located action in our intentions. When he gave his shortest analysis of his awakening, it was a causal principle. When this is, that is. When this isn't, that isn't. From the arising of this comes the arising of that. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. Actually, two principles. The first one is causality in the moment. In other words, the cause arises and the effect arises at the same time. When the cause goes away, the effect goes away at the same time. The second principle is causality over time. An example of the first would be putting your finger in the fire. And you're not going to wait until your next lifetime for it to hurt. It's going to hurt immediately. You take it out, it feels immediately a lot better. But there's still going to be some long-term consequences. That's causality over time. One action can operate under both principles. And so when we can push the world around, who's doing the pushing? Our intentions. But they're pushing against the results of past intentions. If the past intentions were good, things will go in line with the way we want them to. If they were not, they put up resistance. We have very little control over what's coming in from the past. We can develop states of mind that minimize the effect of past actions. 
It's one of the reasons why we develop limitless goodwill, limitless compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, to make our minds enlarged. We develop virtue, concentration, discernment, so the mind is not overcome by pain or overcome by pleasure. When you've developed those qualities of mind, it actually can have an effect on past bad actions. But they can't turn bad actions, or the results of bad actions, into something good, but they can minimize the bad. But the important thing is what we do with our minds right now, our intentions right now. We have to have faith in our present intentions, because there are times when the world outside just does not respond to our desires at all. You look around, there's the pandemic, there's the mess in politics. And you realize people are going to make decisions, and you have no control over them. But you do have control over your own intentions, and it does make a difference. Just because bad influences are coming in from outside doesn't mean you have to respond in a bad way, or that they have to push you around. We do have this element of free choice here in the present moment. How much free choice? There's no number by which you can measure it, say you have X percentage of free choice at any one time. But you always do have the choice to do something skillful, even if it's simply refraining from something unskillful, holding yourself back. But that ability to refrain, refrain yourself, that is skillful. Now there may be bad consequences. You can think of situations in which people are trying to force you to do something that's unskillful, and they're going to punish you if you don't. You refuse. You have to put up with the punishment. But at least you preserved the quality of your intention. And you have to believe in that. You have to have faith in that. Because that, of course, is what's going to create influences now and on in the future. Sometimes the influences now are not all that visible, but they will have an influence in the future. It's because of this principle that we're training the mind. This is why we meditate. We may be meditating or coming to meditation for other reasons. When you meditate long term, though, this is why you stay, because you realize that the quality of your intentions shapes your life. And so you have to look into the quality of your mind in the present moment. We're trying to bring the mind to the, to the breath, to give it an anchor in the present moment, both so that it can see the present moment clearly and so it has strength to do what's right. When you get the mind still, you can see things moving in the mind that you wouldn't otherwise. Areas of the mind that were blurry, or foggy, or muddy, get clear. And as the mind is still with the breath, feels at home with the breath, gives it strength. It's a sense of well-being, but the well-being is not an end in and of itself. As Buddha said, one of the results of concentration is that sense of well-being, a pleasant abiding in the here and now. You can breathe in ways that feel really good deep down into the body. But that sense of pleasure can also be a source for strength. It's food for the mind. It's when we're feeling frazzled, tired. It's hard sometimes to do the things that we know would be the right thing to do, but we feel we just don't have the strength. 
but when the mind is well fed like this, then it does have the strength to figure out what the skillful thing would be in any situation and to carry it through. So in training the mind, we're keeping ourselves alive, because this is where our life is, in the quality of our present intentions. And having faith in the quality of our present intentions, because the world can look pretty bleak at times. But if you look inside yourself and realize, oh, you have a power here inside, you know that there may be constraints outside, still you've got this potential here, so you want to keep it alive. And you do that by regarding the practice as something you do while you're sitting here with your eyes closed, but also when you're moving around outside, engaged in the world, always looking for what is the skillful thing to do right now. It may be little things, but if you develop that habit of looking for what's skillful and carrying it through, you find that the habit grows, and you're capable of things that are more and more skillful all the time. Now this is one of those truths that becomes true because you believe in it. There was an American philosopher, William James, who said there are basically two kinds of truths. They're the truths of the observer. Say we're trying to watch the movement of the planets and wanting them to be a certain way actually gets in the way of seeing what they are. For centuries they wanted the orbits of the planets to be circles, and they tried their darndest to make them fit into their idea of what the planet's orbit should be. And it wasn't until someone came along and said, no, they're not circles, they're ellipses, and they finally realized what was actually going on. That was the case where your desires get in the way of seeing what's really true. But there are other truths that have to become true because you believe in them. And your freedom to do what is skillful and to explore how far skillfulness can go, that's a truth you have to believe in for it to happen. Just like being an athlete. If you believe that you can be a good runner, okay, you've got hope. If you don't believe you can, then no matter how strong you are, there's no hope at all. It's our hope for safety, our hope for well-being. lies in having, have, having faith in the quality of our current intentions and keeping that faith alive by trying to act on our most skillful intentions, whatever seems to be most skillful at any time, and checking on the results. And if it turns out it was wrong, well, you've learned, and you can apply that knowledge the next time around. But you're taking your intentions really seriously. There's an old Peanuts cartoon where Lucy's complaining. She says, if you have to go around watching everything you say, you never get much said. And the Buddha would have responded, well, that's the whole point. You don't have to get a lot said. You want to get skillful things said. And that means you have to watch everything you say. You have to watch everything you do. Now, this may sound onerous, and it would be if it weren't for the fact that we can base it on our practice of concentration, have food for the mind. That too is a form of skill we can develop. So it's not just work. It's learning how to feed the mind in a way that gives it long-term strength, deep strength. And 
and large strength. This is why the Buddha uses the image of a large river, of the earth, of space, to describe the quality of mind he wants us to develop. People can dig in the earth, but they can't make it be without earth. It's just too big. People can try to set fire to the water of the river, but it won't set fire. They can try to write things all over space, but nothing stays in space. Those are the qualities you want to keep in mind. As you stay focused, those are skillful images to keep in mind. So learning this principle of being skillful in the present moment is not simply just working. It's not a chore. It's also learning how to furnish the mind, nourish the mind, feed the mind, so that it finds true happiness in doing so. The rewards are not all at the end of the path. They're all along the way. <laughs>